Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be reviewing the awesome V4D box driven full motion platform from the guys at JCL, a full 4DOF simulator with a very convincing surge motion element. JCL builds and ships these systems to anywhere in the world. My unit arrived in a wooden crate that had a top line build on it. So they aren't kidding about getting it done. Time to put this V4 platform through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So let's get to it. So let's take a quick tour of the bottommost part of this V4 chassis. And I'm calling this the motor controller slider assembly <laughs> because that's what everything, you know, that's where everything happens. This is where all the motion is. And it also is the sliding rails that give us the surge capacity or element to this whole cockpit. Right, so first of all, we've got four D-Box actuators. Now this is a 4250 set, and these are Gen 2s, and that means there's four actuators that are capable of 250 pounds each, and they are one and a half inch as far as travel, which is the basic entry level set that you get from D-Box. Right, so let's go over and look at these controller boxes first. And we have three of them, which with Gen 2, I was a little surprised. I thought we would see just two and one with three cables on it or three controllers in it. But that's not how this is set up. But anyway, first off, we'll look at these guys here. And these are the two normal boxes that you get with the 4250 system. And you can see here it says 4250 AC211 ABS MS. I don't know, I don't know what all this means. <laughs> uh, control module probably two. And then a G2 63, and it looks like the inch symbol. Well, we know this is not 63 inch actuators, so it stands for something else apparently. And it's got an F on it here. That's for the front one. And you can see up here, they've got it mapped out on their decals, what this represents. And that would be the front left and right actuator. And then we have our cables coming out and we'll go over to the other box and it's the same thing. Just a, a direct copy of that, except these actuators are being used for the rear actuators. And you can see it mapped out on the stickers there and the two cables coming out. Now, this is where things get a little different. This is the controller box for the three inch actuator. It says a one 250. So this is a 250 actuator according to this label. So yeah, and it's an AC 231 ABS S. So that must be the designation for the three inch somehow. And of course the control module too. And also with the G2 63 whatever that means, actuator set. <laughs> and S stands for the surge function. And you can see, obviously, we have a cable coming out. Now, we also have cables on the other side for controlling, for actually communication, rather, and power. Obviously, we have a power mains plug there going in. We have three communication plugs there. We'll go over to one of the 4250 boxes, and it has two there. And this actually links, that wire actually daisy chains over to this one. And then that's other wire on the left side there. Daisy chains over to this guy. And it's hard to see all the one connections here, but I'm trying to show you. I don't know how well it's going to show up. But there's actually four plugs plugged in down there. And I, I don't know what all of them are for. I know one's comm, and one's the daisy chain connection, and one's going over to our interface for the computer which was to look at next. Now, curious thing here about this, and I'll show you guys as I put this down. We have a, first I'll just show you that. This is a KCU 1P interface, right? They call it the motion controller. But sitting on top of that is actually, well, I can't do that with a, without setting it, with setting it flat, but this one is actually, I'll turn it around so we get the right number here a KAI-1P. You notice this is what, it doesn't require any power supply. This actually runs off the power off the USB port on your PC. Very convenient. And this is what came with my 4400 actuator system. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure why this one, the KCU, why they're using that here, it must be because of this other actuator. And if you, the reason I'm asking is, or thinking out loud, basically, there's a power supply right there. And it's a DC conversion, obviously, AC to DC power supply conversion. And we're going to go around the other side of this 
KCU-1P. And take a look at it. And here we can see it says KCU-1P. And this is being powered, if you can see how well you can see that, it's actually a DC 48 volt, but it's only 0.638 amps, so it's not a lot of power available on tap, but it is a 48 volt interface. Interesting. I just find it interesting that we're running this on this system when it, all you have to use is that little thing over there for the controller interface on a 4400 system. So I'm thinking that this three inch actuator is pulling some power and that's why we have to do it that way. But that's all speculation. Right, now cable management is actually very good here. You can see we have some zip ties here and we have the main cable there nice and coiled up and zip tied down. Everything is really well done here on cable management. We've got some clips, let me see if you can see that there, alongside of the profile that's actually using those clips right there for routing of the cables that are going to the actuators. Very slick, very neat job over here, same thing. And we have some, as you can see, some 4040 profiles here that are running all the way back to this connector back here where that middle bar is. And that's to support these boxes. And it's actually sitting lower, let's go down here, than the actual frame is. And you can see we've got a couple of gusseted corner brackets holding them up and they're connected all the way over to this middle bar here. And of course we have another support bar in the middle tying these two, I'm calling them 4080s, together. And now that we're back here, we can actually take a look at the three inch actuator that is, adds the surge element to this chassis. And you can see this interesting, they've got a and we'll, once I get the sliding chassis on here, we'll take a closer look at that or another look at it. And you can see I've already taken that chassis off and there's some T-nuts that were actually, uh, there's some flanges on that that make to that. So we'll see that once we get there. And so yeah, just using another piece of profile, interfacing it with this bracket, huge bolt going through here. And it is a rod end in there, as you can see. So we've got some wiggle room in there so, so it doesn't get all bound up. And yeah, three inches of travel on this puppy. And it's definitely longer than the other ones, no doubt. There's also, I don't know how well that's going to show up. It looks like a piece of felt or Velcro, the fuzzy Velcro part between the back of that actuator and the main support back here. Now, this main support, if you look, it's got huge corner brackets in it. These things are... 80 millimeters wide and they're all one piece units so you can see that's a heck of a support going on there and it continues on to the other side over here and that's to support the bar this is not actually supporting the back of this i don't think as far as movement obviously the main connection point for this actuator is right there using a regular d-box c type of clamp deep c i call it <laughs> so yeah that's where the brunt of the force is taken on this other piece right here that's underneath that. And that's also a 4080, obviously. And yeah, so, but when it's pushing against this middle piece here and against the chassis piece up there, when all this is happening and sliding back and forth, then yeah, the, the force is going to be from this middle bar here, pushing on the front bar up there and pulling on the back one here. So you can see that's why we have these extra heavy duty supports. You know, this is all built to like commercial standards. It really is. This is heavy duty build here. And I don't know how, how well this is translating in video, but it's certainly is something that's going to last a long time, it looks like. And that's just from initial impressions from me. And of course, we have some more clips down here that are routing our cables for our cable management. Everything's nice and neatly zip tied. Yes, very well done here. Very professional job. Yeah. And let's see, I can get a part number off of this, but that's about all. There's not a lot of information on this, some serial numbers and stuff that doesn't mean anything, I'm sure. But there's the part number for that three inch actuator that we're gonna use for the surge function. Now we have, we'll go ahead and show you these things. I'm gonna give you a, a back shot of it. I don't know how well that's showing up. See the rail that this is, is this must be a Delrin, some kind of a Delrin rail, I'm thinking. And it's got a, see the shape to it? where it has a groove down the middle of it. And the carrier 
or the saddle or the whatever you want to call it this little l bracket actually it's not little it's pretty pretty substantial rides on that and i can actually push it with one finger very easily so there's no friction here it almost sounds like to me that there's some bearings inside of here somewhere and you see give you a close-up of that and there's actually a set screw in there too so i'm thinking maybe that might be something that's retaining a, a, a rail in there that has some kind of bearings because when i move it it feels like yeah it almost has that feel or sound of some bearings being in that rail part section and you can see the lubrication on it in different spots but it moves very easily but when you try to move it laterally i'm twisting it with my hand here it doesn't budge i mean it's tight it's just nothing there <laughs> it's very very tight of course it's just my hand but still very neat the way this operates and you can't really see the grooves very well maybe you can with the reflections there that are actually in that strip of what i'm guessing is delrin so yeah that's how it works and of course we have one here we have one over there to capture the rear part of the driver cockpit and we have two up there on the left and the right all the same so yeah works very well and actually there's it's not the whole slider encompassed under here i'm going to give you come over here and show you underneath see we got one there and we've got one here so we just have two support points there but i tell you what when i grab this and move it i'm just really surprised at just how tight it is in this direction going ladder uh well right now in this orientation front and back because i'm pulling that way but yeah very tight just nothing nothing moving there very surprising actually <laughs> All right, so what else can we talk about? Okay, these are the actuators that we're using for the set of the 4250. So if you guys wanna look at that, there it is. And they came with these feet here, these nylon feet and these steel cups. Call them, they call them non-captive cups. So, and they've got some rubber pads underneath them and that's how we set it on the floor. And we have some big angle brackets up here at the corners so yeah this thing is everywhere you look there's there's brackets and these are thick heavy duty brackets everywhere you look on this thing it's just well built piece of equipment here this whole unit weighs in at a hundred little over just over 122 pounds so it's very substantial i had to have a friend come over and help me move this part of the chassis from the crate that it came in over here to the srg right so I think we covered everything here. We've got the bundle of power cables coming out here. And there's actually four mains plugs here. And they're 110 volt, like they should be. And we've got a USB connection here. If you look at this USB connection, it's got a huge ferrite sink on it for EMI reduction. I mean, that's big. So I suspect it's going to do a very good job. And that's about it. I don't think there's anything else to look at that you guys might want to see here. Very well built, like I said, to commercial standards, commercial levels. And I'm sure that's where they sell these, uh, most of these types of platforms at the price point it comes in as a commercial solution for gaming rooms and what have you, or people who have the means that want to have one in their home. Right. So what we'll do next is, yeah, we're going to put the driver chassis or cockpit section on top of this bolt it up get everything and get the actuator we're going to bolt the actuator back there to the rear of that chassis so we can push and pull it and yeah when we come back we'll have that set up and take a look at how that works so i wanted to do a quick how it works segment on the slider system it's such a trick system that yeah they designed and engineered this themselves at jcl in-house and yeah they did a great job and anyway this is the cradle here that captures the side of your cockpit. And you'll notice also, these are oblong holes here in the side of this bracket, which lets us attach any 40 series type of profile onto these cradles or brackets, whatever you want to call them. I'm calling them cradles because they kind of catch everything. It kind of sits on top of it. So, yeah, this is, I believe, let's see what this mic's out to. At least we're out, this is like five mil or more. Let's see what we got there. There we go almost five and a half millimeter thick aluminum plate here. And it's got that nice powder coating that the whole system has on it. 
And yeah, so that's nice and stiff piece there. And I've already been using the unit. So yeah, I can vouch that there's really no flex in this. And on the bottom is where all the trick is happening. Well, maybe not all the trick, but some of it. We have these two carriers, right? One here, one there. And each one of them, you can look inside there. You can see it has some bearings in it on that side. And we have some bearings on this side and some grease, which is a good idea. <laughs> so yeah, very trick little little deal going on here where the these bearings are actually at the top part of that groove that are catching the top edge of that hourglass glass hourglass shaped rather uh, Delrin rod or rail that it rides on. So they're a nice long contact area of bearing surface uh, along the complete length of each one of these. And we'll see the one on the bottom there, same setup. There we go. Yeah. So, and of course, this this is all metal here, and this this piece here that's sitting inside of it. So it's riding on top of that rail as we're pushing it back and forth. I got a little another shot of it, me pushing it back and forth. Very smooth, uh, no friction at all. It's just very well. Obviously, there's a little bit of friction, but very minimal amounts of friction. Again, just a marvelous piece of engineering here from JCL. I'm really impressed with that. So that's how it, it operates as far as allowing it to slide. And remember, we're putting a lot of weight on this top of this thing and on that rail that's captured in the actual profile itself. And yeah, it does a great job. I, I mean, you can put all that weight on this and it's still, you know, I've got other places that I'm demonstrating moving things that are set up with this. And just very, very smooth. And once you put weight, actually, once you weight it down, it actually rolls a little smoother, it seems like, or easier. So, yeah, very, very genius here. I really like what I'm seeing here, the way this is working. And once we have this on the rail, there's, like, no lateral flex in that rail at all. So that's what makes me think it's like Delrin or something very hard like that. And you just can't, I can't twist it now. I might be able to once the frame's in there and grab the top part of the frame that's sticking up, you know, that's mounted to like a wheelbase upright and then do it. But then I'm putting a heck of a lot of leverage on it. But in the normal use, there's no lateral leverage like that on this. It's just sliding back and forth straight, just like that. So yeah, very cool. Now I want to show you this locking mechanism that or mechanism that is also designed by JCL. They 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 got this so it would actually capture that same Delrin rail. And it works like this. We got a piece sitting up here and one on the other side. And it's kind of a triangle shape there. And they're catching the edges, the, the top edges, just like these bearings do here. It catches the top edges of that Delrin rail. So when we're turning this, and it turns a lot, but, you know, in other words, it's moving a lot, and I'm turning it very slightly. So it does move pretty quick. And that's why we only have like a quarter turn to loosen and to tighten it back up. But you can see as it's turning, these two cams, if you will, are grabbing the side of that rail. Very cool. It's a, it's a dual threaded stud in there. You can see the threads there. That's carrying these two pieces here. Obviously they're threaded. And there is, I'm trying to think and see if there's, doesn't look like, yeah, there's no really groove here on these pieces of metal to capture the edge of that. So it just squeezes it. And you know, for the minimum amount that it takes to lock this down, it's amazing to me how this works so well. It just does such a great job. And if you look at the Delrin rails that I've been using them, there's no marks from these on the sides of them where they've been squeezing them, the rails when I'm tightening, tightening it back down, loosening it, adjusting it, tightening it back down. So yeah, very ingenious design here, guys. This works so well. I'm very impressed. And I'm not easily impressed with this kind of stuff. They've done a really great job in the, the bearings on both sides of the rail, capturing the side of that Delrin rail. is just, just really works so well. And obviously, the load bearing is very good also because it seems like the more weight I put on it, the easier this thing runs. Right, so we'll move on to the next segment. So now we have the driver cockpit chassis mounted. And this is what's going to slide back and forth, of course. And you can see those brackets that we saw before 
are now filled up with 4080 profile and some T-nuts and M8 bolts on both sides here. Maybe you look at it down there. And moving around to the rear for our surge, you can see that is bolted with some rather large L bracket configuration going on there. And we have two M8s on each side on that piece of profile we saw before securing this. Go ahead and look at it down here too. All right, and we've got some nice aluminum plate here, some diamond plate, nice and shiny. That's to keep your feet from stepping on the controller boxes when you're getting in and out. And you see we have some also some new sliders sitting on this frame, and that we have three of them there. That's for the wheelbase mount assembly, and it is also tying in on this back one over here. This one is catching the rear of the shifter mount assembly. It's all kind of like one piece once you get it together. So, yeah, you can slide. It's pretty cool. You can slide the wheelbase assembly, the whole assembly, and your shifter back and forth in relation to the, where the seat's actually sitting. So, yeah, not a lot to see here. I mean, it's the same 4080 profile everywhere. And we have normal gusseted corner brackets everywhere securing this part. Right, because this is going to be sliding back and forth. It's not going to be taking a lot of stress like the section back here when that actuator is moving back and forth in the surge function. So yeah, now what we'll do is go ahead and put on, I think I'm going to go ahead and put the pedal tray on, and we'll take a look at that when we get back. So here's the pedal tray. And this was also pre-assembled when I got it, but I just take, took it off as one unit. Easy enough to see what's going on here. We have some M8 bolts on either side of this 4040 profile that it, the frame is built on, on both sides over here. You see it over there. And we have, on top of that, we have some 4080s on the sides and 4040s across the middle. And it's not that wide as far as for pedal assemblies. It's, I've, I've fit a couple of them on there already and it's either it's too narrow or it's too wide. <laughs> well, it's really meant for HPP pedals, pedals like that, individual pedals, HPPs, SEs, those things. Or, or pedals like that you can just bolt them directly to that if you want and you've already got your diamond plate heel plate here or you can obviously do something else which is i think that's what i'm going to do and yeah we also have a 4080 on the bottom giving us some more structural integrity to this whole assembly so three pieces of 4080 and then they're connected in the back with those 4040s now one of the coolest things about this very slick is it's on a slider as you can see right and we've got those delrin rails with our these silver pieces here that you've been seeing i've been to tell you are stops obviously keep it from sliding off and it's real easy to do this i'll try to do this one-handed here so you guys can watch and you don't have to unscrew these all you have to do is turn them like a quarter of a turn they just come right loose that easy i'm gonna go over here and get these guys just gotta pop them loose and then this thing will slide with hardly any effort that's a lot of travel there. Yeah, I really like this. This is going to make it a lot easier on me when people come <laughs> over to the SRG and want to try out something. Yeah, and then once you've got, you got it where you want, it's just another quarter turn, and your quarter turn on either side. Let's find the other one over here. There it is. And it's locked down. I mean, it is locked down. It's not going anywhere. Very nice. I like that. Again, as I said before, this is a commercial grade kind of rig here. And yeah, it, you want adjustability like that, especially if you're going to be putting it in a gaming room or, you know, in that kind of environment. Even if you are a race team owner and you want one of these for your drivers, different size drivers can adapt really quickly by moving that pedal tray there. And of course, remember, we got sliders for that wheelbase mount that's going on next. And yeah, they do the same thing again. Very, very easy to make adjustments, but we'll see that once we get back. So we have the wheelbase assembly mounted now, and we'll go ahead and take a closer look at this and, and how it's assembled. First, we have an upright here that is a 4080, and at the bottom we have another slider cradle or saddle, if you will. And if you look, they're the same size, actually. Well, it's a little off here, but yeah, they are the same size as far as the ones that are 
for the chassis and yeah they're using the same size everywhere including the pedals over there so yeah this is going to move as we discussed before on this delrin i'm guessing rail here and yeah we've got these huge corner brackets here and yeah they look like they're going to be very good as far as supporting any aft or longitudinal movement there of the wheelbase so we'll go ahead and come back up and across the top we have a another piece of 4080 profile and also a couple of 40s coming off of that and that's where you're going to mount your wheel or your wheelbase rather for your wheel and if we look underneath we see we've got two of those gusseted corner brackets on both sides and we've got these other pieces here on the bottom that are adding support so that should be pretty stiff i would imagine and while we're here there's another piece of 4080 and it's got a couple of corner brackets two of them mounting it to this upright here this 4080 upright and it's actually capturing the top part or the top foot of this adjustable height adjustable wheel assembly and there's the other piece over there and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. So yeah, this is so that we can actually raise and lower our wheel with no problem very quickly and then lock it back down. Now on the bottom, the foot that's capturing the other end of it here, again, the same kind of configuration, except we have two corner brackets on the bottom, two corner brackets on the top, and that short piece of 4080 profile. And it has a spring there that helps assist as far as when you're gonna raise the wheelbase back up. You got a heavy wheelbase like a 54 Cole Morgan or something on here, 54 G. Yeah, you're gonna need that spring assist. Oh, it, it certainly has got to help, right? And the same thing over there. We've got the two on top, two on bottom, and that 4080 piece capturing the foot on that piece over there. So, yeah, this is gonna be pretty convenient. And again, we'll look at how that works in just a second. We're gonna while I'm here, I'm gonna walk around the back, and you can see the other piece of 4080 profile spanning the whole top of this wheelbase assembly and we have some steel brackets here that are attaching that and holding it up to this piece of 4080 up here remember that 4080 has two corner brackets underneath it so a very solid looking assembly now we have a tray assembly here too and this is for your controller box if you have a controller box with whatever wheelbase system you're using like the bodner's the OSW or SemiCube 1 as we're calling it now. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so I'm not sure I'm going to use that. Probably not. I probably just because I have this cart back here that I keep everything on. And so I probably won't be using that. Anyway, so coming around to the front, we're going to walk around the other side. And it's really the, just the, nut, the same thing that's going on as we saw before on that side. So it's all duplicated over here. Very nicely done. And you can see again the corner brackets down there on our moving platform. So now what I'm going to do is go over and go ahead and just demonstrate how this is all working. And first we'll demonstrate the height adjustment here. And again, just like these sliders that we demonstrated before, this is very quick to use. You just turn it like a quarter of a turn and it loosens it. And these are chromed bars that these sliders, and it's the same kind of slider configuration it looks like to me, or very much the same, I guess. And I, I haven't pulled one apart, so I can't exactly say it's the same. But it looks like there's some kind of a Durlin insert maybe in here that's riding up and down on these chromed rods. So all you do is push down, and you can see it goes down. Very simple. And it's, it's yeah, compressing the spring down there. So when you want to loosen it up and raise it for someone else, let's say you have a taller driver and you have a sh from coming from a shorter driver down here, first we can just turn that a quarter turn and that's, that's locked. And I tell you, this feels very solid. You know, with all these connections in here and all these sliders for convenience, you know, it's always going to be a bit of a compromise on the stiffness of a chassis. I mean, there's just no way around it. It's not going to be as stiff as, say, you know, a P1 with everything bolted together. There's that heavy thing. Yeah. But you get a heck of a lot of convenience here. And I can't really feel any noticeable flex. And once we have, a, obviously, a wheel on here and running it, we'll, we'll be able to determine better. But right now, this is a very solid configuration. You can see with all the bracing we have up here and underneath here, that it's really, yeah, it's, it's very solid. And these chromed bars here that everything is running on also add to the feel 
of how solid it can be. Right, so then when you're ready to adjust for the taller guy, it just comes right up. Of course, if I have a, a Cole Morgan 54G on here, it might not just jump up like that, <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> so anyway, again, just lock it. It's really easy. I mean, there's no twisting, you know, to, to like a T-nut on the other side that you got to keep twisting it down until you get it tight. Very convenient, very quick. Again, this lends to the whole theme of this chassis, as I'm probably going to say many times, to its commercial build quality and intention to be used in a commercial environment or in a, a race team environment or something like that. Right, so we also have the sliders down here. So let's go ahead and, again, quarter turn. Let me walk around the other side here. Quarter turn, and now we can move it. And this thing moves very slow. I'm just putting one finger on here, and this thing's just moving very, very easily. And we've got, look at the range of this thing. It's got a lot of range on it. So yeah, I don't think you could ever get somebody in here that you couldn't get the reach right for them without even moving the seat. And remember, the seat is actually a fixed unit. Of course, you could change that to a slider if you really wanted to. But with all the adjustability in the pedals and in the wheel assembly here, I'm not sure that you would want to. Right, but anyway, you can see very, very nice to, to move this around. And again, to lock it down again. Quarter of a turn, actually, on these. And it just locks right down. Just like that. And now it's very solid. Yeah. It's amazing to me. Well, not, I don't know if maybe amazing is the wrong word, but it's very interesting to me that how solid this can be. I mean, I didn't think, you know, with these sliders, I think this, I thought this thing would be shaking around a little bit. But it's really, I mean, if I put all my weight and jerk on it real hard, I could probably get this to move. But I could do that to the P1 also, you know, the Simulab P1. And it's, it's stiffer than this. I mean, I can make it move if I really want to. But, you know, this is very, I mean, it's one of those things where you have to be here and have it in hand to feel about what I'm talking about. But again, we'll demonstrate that once we're actually in it and driving. So that's really about it. Not much else going on here. Uh, not that there's not enough going on here. <laughs> so yeah, I'm really liking what I'm seeing here. I don't know about you guys, but this is really this is really impressive as far as the engineering and design and what they've come up with after what have, has been years of testing and making minor improvements here and there as, the, as they develop this. So yeah, right now, uh, this is their latest design and it's it's impressive, I have to say, at this point anyway. So what we'll do next is, let's see, what do we got left? We've got the shifter arm, which is no big deal. It's going to be its, on its own slider, but we'll see that when we get there. And then, of course, we're going to have to mount our seat to the back part of the chassis, and then we'll be done. It's just a matter of getting our wheel and our pedals mounted, and we're ready to go. So this is what the shifter mount looks like. And, of course, this is adjustable. This, cross, this top crossbar, we can go up or down with that, depending on what we need. And, again, you can see on the back of this, just like on the front part of the wheelbase mount, we have those very beefy looking corner brackets. And you can actually see the mechanism that's used when we lock and unlock. So you can see why it's only of a quarter of a turn to unlock that. So yeah, just thought I'd give you guys a little quick look at that under there. And yeah, not much to see here except, uh, yeah, it's going to be easy to adjust. It's gonna move with the wheel which is kind of the way you want it to do if you've got somebody who needs to change their position. And what I'll do is go ahead and get over here and see how this thing slides by loosening these other two sides. Okay, that one's loose, that one's not loose. It's okay, so now this whole assembly, again, just with one finger, man, this is, this is so precise. It's just amazing how, how well all this works and yeah, so, yep, yeah, we're, we're taking the wheel, the shifter, and being able to move that back and forth depending on how far the person, you know, needs to go as far as sitting. And, of course, we have the pedals sliding back and forth that can adjust, too. So, yeah, again, very cool stuff. And what we're going to do next is go ahead and get our seat brackets mounted, and then we'll go get our seat mounted. Here are the JCL Racing to Be Faster seat brackets. And they're mounted on 4080 profiles with the gusseted corner brackets again on one side and the other one has them just like that one on the other side and this are <laughs> in case you can't tell these are very bright bright red 
uh, in between red and orange. You know, almost I almost call it orange. Might be more orange than red. It depends on. It's kind of strange the way the light hits it. It kind of looks red in one way, and then it looks orange the other. Very bright. Yeah, can't miss this cockpit with those things on there, right? <laughs> Actually, I kind of like the bright stuff. You know, the contrast with the black. It looks pretty good. Right. So that's all mounted. Now all I have to do is get our seat mounted. So we have our seat mounted to the JCL seat brackets. And this is an NRG Prisma seat that I'm also doing a review on. A uh, pretty nice bucket seat, actually. Anyway, it's very easy to adjust for width on this seat. Now, this particular seat was, I think it was 400, no. Yeah, 430 millimeters wide in the back. So that's why I, I pre-adjusted these 4080 profiles you see on the side here. Pre-adjusted those to that width. And, yeah. It fit in pretty easy. No big deals here. No dramas. Just went right in like it should. And yeah, so we got the seat mounted. And I have a... You see in the corner there, that's a SimuQ Pro. SimuQ 2 Pro. I'm not sure if that's the one I'm actually going to be using. I'm just mocking that up right now. I need to get the pedals on also before we can start driving. So, yeah, that, we'll get to the mounting of the wheel and the pedals next. Here are the HPP... PRX SE pedals and I mounted these as an example of the individual mounted pedals like the Husingvelds. You can see that they are actually individual pedals that you can mount. You can see the back six millimeter bolts that I have holding that to that 40 series profile and we can see across the front here the same thing and the only thing all my pedal sets will fit this except the Simworks. The Italy Impetus will fit, the Fanatics V3s will fit, and the Elites. All that stuff fits no problem. It's 340 millimeters between these two 4080 series profiles here that you see. So, yeah, just a little bit short for that set, the Simworks. And I think that, you know, another 20 millimeters to the length of this, maybe make it 360 for the spread. But again, when you order your chassis from JCL Racing, yeah, they'll do whatever you want to. They can cut those profiles a little longer, which will make it a little bit wider. And then, yeah, if you had SimWorks, they would fit in there, no problem. But yeah, this is really a good setup as far as this pedal tray, as I talked to you before. Very, so easy to adjust this as far as back and forth from the driver's position, just really nice. And yeah, not much else to say about it. We just have to get in and drive it, right? To really see what's going on with it. So we'll get to our next segment. Before I show you my wheelbase mounted, I am going to be mounting a Cole Morgan 54G. And that's a pretty heavy wheelbase and a long one. So I, I'd made a couple of changes here to increase the stability and firmness or stiffness. And I remember, I'm gonna show you some footage here of the original mount, the way this rig came. And it had these 40 profiles, these 40 series profiles that were attached to the very front of the rigs 4080 wheel base mount piece that runs the length of this right so i want to do something a little different because i didn't want that heavy motor just sitting out here on the edge and yeah that's going to give it more leverage against this the whole assembly anyway and i'd like to minimize that at every chance i can but remember there was a assembly back here that was holding the controller box for your wheel system be it in a, a semi cube one or the the bodner that we're talking about now and I took that and, yeah, took those parts and used them over here. <laughs> and what I did was, was take, and I actually used some longer, longer profiles here. This, this was the short one here. You can see it's a little bit shorter. Not that that made that much of a difference as far as the length. But, yeah, I went ahead and used the longer ones. And I took all the angle brackets that were on this other assembly and, yeah, put them to use over here. So I put them to work over here. So I got four on each side of these 40-40 profiles, as you can see here. And... We also have them underneath here. You can see I got one on each side. All right. So that's going to allow us to have a very firm arm coming out here, which I need to be able to mount that Cole Morgan. And it's going to be less flex in general because now we're not putting all the flexing pressure on the edge of this profile right here. We're actually putting it back here. Now there is some still because remember that corner bracket we got hanging right here. There is still going to be some some pressure put on that on up and down pressure when you're turning the wheel if you're turning it like you're supposed to 
and but this is going to spread it around if it were as it were at least that's what i think it's going to do and it's got to be stiffer than having it just mounted off the edge like this with the two corner brackets on each side and remember there wasn't even a corner bracket underneath we had this plate here underneath and again that's good enough for most wheelbases i would imagine but yeah putting this heavy 54g coal morgan on here i just wanted to beef it up a little bit and i wasn't going to use the assembly back here anyway so why not put it to work right so when we come back we'll have the wheelbase actually mounted now we have the Cole Morgan 54G motor actually mounted. And yeah, it went on really well. And you can see that with those longer profiles, get this cable out of the way. It really could have been shorter, the profiles themselves, because I have it backed up all the way to the back of the 4080 profile that goes across and supports this wheelbase section. And you can see it's a little bit of a gap back there. Now here's where I wanted to say I had a SimuCube 2 Pro mounted up here just as, you know, just doing some test fitting and seeing what I wanted to do as far as what I really wanted to use here. And I do prefer my, my Bodner SS2 with this Cole Morgan motor on it. So I went ahead and switched back to that. But one consideration here is because we don't have a lot of room back here, and of course this is a very long motor, I have to remember that. If you have a motor like the new Podiums or the SimuCube 2, like the Pro I had on here, remember, it's great to have that controller box that we don't have to use anymore, but it brings its own things to the table. <laughs> you know, it always does, no matter what we do. It seems like we've always got something, well, I wish I could do this. Because here, I have a nice flat back. I don't have to worry about interference with this bar here. And yeah, with one of those motors like a Podium or an, a SimuCube 2, they have all the plugs in the back so you've got to push this motor up to be able to you know have room for those plugs this thing quit knocking around on me here have room for those plugs there we go and also if this if you have the movable one like we have here then going up and down you have to be mindful about how much room those plugs have and what kind of bend they have in them to clear this back bar but there's different configurations you can get this V4 cockpit in. And I'm going to be talking more about that somewhere else in the, in the video. But yeah, you can actually pretty much custom order what you want. And yeah, put any cockpit on top of their sliding uh, mechanism. But what, like I said, we'll talk about more about that later on. But right now, the Cole Morgan is doing well. It's, it's looking good up here. And everything is going to work out just fine. I turned my... Connectors, I usually have them pointed out back, but I have them turned towards the front now because I'm going to take my cables and kind of bring them out and loop them and then take them back out the back here. And I might put my quick uh, cutoff, rather, my emergency cutoff button up here with them. So, yeah, there we have it, all mounted and ready to go. And again, the flex, remember, I'm, this is a long motor and I got a lot of leverage out here where, this, where the steering wheel is. And there is... A little bit of flex here but the whole thing is that the flex is not in this part in here it's actually down here where this corner bracket is all right this one is attaching to our adjustment mechanism and to the bottom of this 4080 profile up here that's where we're seeing some, some movement and it's not a lot it's not a lot so it's less than it was remember uh, we when we did the, uh, the segment just before this and we changed out the way they originally had this sitting with the profile sitting on the edge here. This is definitely sturdier and stiffer and gives better support, obviously, than that did. And yeah, we change things around to make things work better all the time here at the SRG. You know, that's what I love to do. And yeah, we're good to go here. So yeah, what we'll do next is talk a little bit. I think the only thing left is the harness tower. And uh, we'll talk about that when we get back. Now let's talk about the what I'm calling the seat harness, the seat belt harness tower, because that's pretty much what it is. It is it bolts onto the bottom. Obviously, this is what we're attaching our waist belts and our shoulder harness bits to. And it bolts onto the bottom here, and it's got a lot of support. You can see we have some corner brackets there attaching to this 4080 profile that attaches to the back of the bottom control motion frame. And then we have no less than four more corner brackets here holding this 4080 piece that goes straight up 
And as we go up, we can see there's another 4080 piece with four more corner brackets on it. This thing, like I said, is, is built to commercial standards, no doubt, with all the support it has. And yeah, you can see that's where we're actually connecting our waist belts too, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But let's go further up, and we have a crossbar on towards the midsection of this tower where we're actually bolting the ends of our shoulder harnesses too. And again, they are supported by corner brackets on both sides. And again, going up the 4080 to the top, and we have another piece of 4080. You can see we've got some corner brackets there supporting this on either side. So we got four for each side of this. So you can see. On this side, we have them too. And over here on this side. And the top part is where we have some brackets that these don't put tension on the belt itself. They're more of a guide function here so that it keeps it at the right angles and doesn't slide around the top of the bar. And this is actually adjustable as far as the angle. I'm going to show you the angle I have right now. And it's a little bit lower. The top of this is a little bit lower than it was. In fact, I'll show you, it was even with this 4080 profile down here when it came, but I've dropped it down about an inch and a half or so, maybe 60, I guess about you know, more like 40 millimeters or so. And yeah, so that was just to get this angle a little bit. It was actually higher sitting up here, so that meant the belt was at a higher angle on my shoulder. And I wanted to get it down a little bit so it was more of an angle going this way instead of this way. And again, this is all personal preference, and it's nice that you can, they've added the adjustability into this so we can actually make this fit what we need. Now, as you might imagine, being attached down here at the bottom of the frame with no other attachment points but going all the way up, that there is actually a little bit, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not, but there's a little bit of a, you can see the belt moving maybe there, but there's a little bit of movement available here. Of course, I'm pushing kind of it sideways. I'm going to go ahead and just do it this way. See that? Now, I'm, I remember that because I'm going to mention that again. And it's not a bad thing. It's actually built into it, and they purposely did it this way. And if we go down here to where the waist belts are, and I can see where this 4080 profile is attached pretty close to where the bottom 4080 that is actually attached to the motion frame down here. So this does not have any movement. Trust me, it doesn't go anywhere when you push on it. At least I can't detect anything. So here, where we attach our waist belts, we actually have a rubber damper type of situation going on here, or assembly. And as the seat pushes forward and, of course, tensions this, this will actually move like that. All right, so that gives you a little bit of a dampening on the seat belt as, as it tightens up on you on this waist belt here. And that's built in, obviously, on purpose. Now, because we have the flex, inherent flex, in the top of this tower, we don't need those dampers on this cross-section here. Now, remember, this has been a lot of testing going on with this system to get it right, to give you, you know, you could have just bolted all this stuff, like, to something that didn't move at all, uh, in, but it wouldn't feel right. You know, it would just snatch so hard when it pressed against you. And it, it just wouldn't give you the feeling that you were in a car. It would give you a feeling that you were in something very stiff that, you know, you know, cars, chassis, even the stiffest chassis, they don't feel as stiff as sitting in a simulator chassis that's very stiff. It's just one of those things, those nuances that they built into this. And remember, JC is actually a real race car driver. So he spent a lot of time researching, trying different things to get this to feel right. And believe me, it does feel right. <laughs> it feels very good. But... Anyway, this is the assembly that really, without it, you got nothing. If you just bolted these waist belts directly to the sliding chassis, you wouldn't feel anything except your weight transfer against the belts, right? So we need this to give us that progressive feeling, or this is a very finesse type system. I'll talk more about that in the driving segments, but it really does more than just push you forward. It gives you much more sensation than that, and it's very, it has a good tuned to it to where it can finesse between, you know, engine braking, real braking, braking at the very end of your braking grip, and, you know, initial braking, trail braking. You can feel all that in this system. They really have done a great job with that. Right, so that's the tower, and yeah, we'll just get on to the next segment. So I managed to get my Pro Sim 
Quafe Engineering H pattern shifter mounted to the shifting assembly, but just barely. Now, this is really a very long shifter. It's yeah, it's it's nowhere near. It's it's the largest shifter you could ever get, I think, for a simulator. At least as far as I know, except maybe putting a real gearbox into your simulator. Anyway, it's very long, and I I had to. And plus, it's tall, so to get it to the right height, I just didn't have enough room here with this configuration as delivered for this particular cockpit. But again, this is easily curable, and JCL will give you whatever you need to make this kind of stuff happen. But I did get it to fit, and that's the main thing, so we can actually use it. And what I really need is another piece of this 4080 profile, but another 200 millimeters long. Then that would give me room between this piece here and over here to get this sitting like it should. But there still might be a height issue, but yeah. Anyway, we did manage to get it mounted. I wasn't sure what I was going to mount but I really wanted to get this on here if it was possible. And yeah, so I'm happy that it was able to fit barely in there so we can do some H pattern shifting. So yeah, there's not much else to see here as far as, you know, we got the shifter mounted. And yeah, so what we'll do next is move on to probably just driving this thing and see how it does. So this is the final setup that I'm going to be using when I run this simulator. And it starts with the HPP PRX Special Edition, or SE pedal set, on the tray down there. We have the excellent Sim Steering 2 direct drive force feedback system from Bodner Electronics, and we're sporting the 54G Cole Morgan motor for this. Steering wheel will be changed out due, based on which car we're driving, obviously. We have the really nice NRG Prisma seat, especially for the money these things are. Everybody really likes this seat. We have the six-point harness, and we have the ProSim shifter sitting over there on the shifter bar. And yes, the H pattern, very nice also. So very good high quality components mounted here. And this is how I'm going to be testing the rig. Now, this I just wanted to show you the quick controls too and how they work again. Now, the quick controls thing will be a godsend for somebody who, you know, let's say you entertain a lot. You got a lot of friends that come over, or people that come over and try your simulator then these quick controls are going to be invaluable to you as far as being able to set things up quick and change to accommodate certain size drivers that are different than others. So, yeah, that's, that's an instance, a commercial operation. You have a gaming room, something like that. Yeah, invaluable there. And in, let's say a racing team had one of these in their, uh, wherever their club is. And, yeah, being able to change between the different racing drivers so they can run their simulations. Again, I don't know if you can put a price on that to be able to do that that quickly and that's easily, and I'll demonstrate that one more time here now that we have everything weighted down with equipment or peripherals. So first thing you do is you've got to do this on both sides, but it's just a quarter turn, and then you're loose. Just like that. There's no wrenching. There's no squeezing of knobs real hard, try to get it to come off. I mean, this stuff just, you can see it just pops loose. And now we're completely loose. So if I had a different size driver in here that had shorter or longer arms, now I'm able to literally one finger take this thing and slide it back and forth. I mean, that's impressive. This, this slider system, and if you saw the, the How It Works slider system segment of this video, you'll know what I'm talking about. Just does such a great job. And now that we have it weighted down, it's even more silky when it moves. Right, so we can also, adjust, once we have our adjustment, we'll, we'll clamp it down again. And we also have the same thing going on down here with our pedal tray. Very, very slick. I mean, I don't know how this is conveying on video, but if you were here, everybody that's tried this is just stunned. They're going, man, this is so cool. Now, we also have, I'm not going to do that because it's a very heavy motor, <laughs> so I'm just going to show you. We can actually adjust the height of the motor, as you saw before, one of the closer look segments. And... The height, and if that will be the adjustment along with what we've already seen with the reach. Now, just one thing to be no, to note here and be aware of is that depending on how your motor is, you're setting your monitor height if you're running monitors. And I like to run mine right up here behind the steering wheel. So I have to accommodate for not only being able to raise it up a little bit if somebody bigger than me gets in here and needs the, the wheel to be higher, but also when this D-Box system is fired up, and we got that fabulous heave going down the straights where you're hitting those bumps. You want to make sure that you've got plenty of clearance between your monitor here because you don't want to go down a bumpy 
part of a circuit somewhere and be smacking the bottom of your monitor with the motor. Yeah, that's, that's not good. So again, just something to be aware of other than that simple stuff. So once we have it set up for the driver that's in there, and again, the way the shifter and everything moves, the symmetry stays the same between the wheel and the shifter, no matter how we move this part of it, which has a very clever and slick design, I think. Because now, if somebody has longer arms, obviously they're gonna have a longer reach to the shifter too. If this was just a fixed shifter back here somewhere, then they're, they were gonna be cramped trying to use the shifter. So yeah, very, very nice, nicely done there as far as engineering. It's just, yeah, moving all at once is very clever. Right, so then of course we're done. All we do is a quarter turn on each one of these knobs on both sides, of course. And we'll walk around here and grab these. And again, just a little snug up. You don't have to put a lot of tension or pressure on this system. And there it is, nice and stiff. <laughs> it's really a, a very, as you can see, a very slick system and being able to adjust for everybody has really been great when I've had other guys come over and, and actually testing this along with me and getting their comments on it. But yeah, very slick uh, system indeed. So now we'll get to some of the driving and analysis of how this wonderful D-Box system works. Not only the pitch, roll, and heave, but the main starring element here is the surge and how all that comes together to give you a really great experience. So here we are in iRacing and I thought I'd show you this while I'm adjusting things, how I have this set up. You can see my feet or you will be able to see my feet and what they're doing. And I have a, a white sticker here, the right edge of that, the right side is in line with the very front of the bottom of this frame. And that's on the, and the ruler is actually on the two inch mark aligned with the bottom of the motion controller frame. So what we're really interested in is seeing how this is moving as far as the top cop pit sitting there. And this will give us an indication as I'm explaining to you and trying to convey what's going on here and what you're feeling when you're in the cockpit. I want to focus on the braking action first. Now watch this. See how the chassis keeps pushing forward as I'm braking there? It's not just, you know, push you forward and the, the harness tightens up and there you have your braking. This is a completely analog dynamic system here. It just feels so natural. It's, it's hard to explain. You have to be in the cockpit and feel it. See how it just keeps pushing you forward. It keeps squeezing you harder and harder into the harness as you're coming to the end of your brake threshold. And then if I do a little trail braking, it'll, it'll apply it again and ease up and then push me into it again. So it's, it's much more than just being pushed into your harness here, as you guys can see. A lot more is going on here. It's directly related to the action of my brake pedal. And you can just watch my foot on the other side there and see how instantaneously this is, is reacting. It's really on point here with feeling very analogish, very realistic. If you're in a, your car just going down the road and you come to a stoplight and you start applying your brakes and applying them harder and harder until we actually stop at the stoplight, we feel more pressure go, moving forward if you have your just your regular seat belt on. But of course, this is amplified because we're at greater speeds and have better, greater grip rather in the tires that we have on a race car. But yeah, this is just something that really surprised me. This is, goes way beyond what I was expecting. It's, you can see how dynamic that is. It's just pretty incredible when you're sitting in here in the seat and you're just feeling that, that extra pressure, squeezing, 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 and then letting off. And yeah, it's just something that you really have to be in it to experience, but I'm hoping I'm showing you and conveying it properly here. Now I'm using a different perspective to try to convey the same thing. This time we're looking at how the seat is moving and the shoulder harnesses are grabbing and also how the waist harness is also doing the work here. You can see the, the damper on the bottom of the waist harness. You can see it bending and it, it you can see it bending back and forth as I'm using the brake pedal. And I'm gonna obviously keep cycling through these brake zones here and show you what's going on with that and with the shoulder harness. And yeah, you can see that it keeps squeezing, but you don't. It, it doesn't convey as well as it does with showing that the white marker or the white sticker on the frame in the cockpit and how it, that relates. It shows you it a lot better. But I just want to give you guys an idea of what the harness is doing here with that tower. Now, there is some flex in the top of this harness tower. I really can't see it that well. I don't know. I, I'm looking for it, but I can't see it that well but it's also doing the same thing that the dampers are doing down here on the waist belts. So as they're bending forward and taking some of that pressure, giving a little damping there, the same thing's happening at the very top of the 
harness tower here, it's actually bending a little bit or flexing a little bit to do the same thing. So it doesn't, it's not a sudden jerky impact when, you, when you're pressed into the belts. It's a very natural feeling, analog feeling as you go into them. If you had all this hard mounted and had the top of that tower supported to where it didn't move at all, then it just wouldn't feel right because it would just, you know, it would snatch on you a little bit too hard, I, I think. This just works together with the tower and the harness and of course the chassis being pushed forward and backwards and mostly forward obviously for the braking. But yeah, I just want to give you another perspective here on how this whole system is coming together, how all its parts are coming together to work as a whole and deliver the solution that it does. Now let's talk about a different kind of braking, engine braking. Yes, something that I've really never felt in a simulator before is engine braking. And I'm gonna exaggerate here with my throttle foot. Just watch what I'm doing with the throttle there as I let off. You can see that you're being thrown into the harness just from being in the gear in the engine brake effect of the car. Now this is something I've never really experienced before. So again, something that this surge system from JCL brings to the table that I wasn't expecting at all. And this will help you understand the capabilities of the car that you're driving a little better and help you tune it a little better possibly because now you know when you lift off the throttle that there is some drag or engine braking it's, it's so much more noticeable and it does it so well it's very it has such a great finesse to it when i'm doing that to the throttle pedal and again it just adds to the whole package you're getting here in this surge element that jcl's bringing to market here and another little pleasant surprise that this surge system brings to the table is the shifting. As I come around the corner here, turn 17, you'll see I'll start shifting on the straight. And it, the whole chassis, you can see that it just pops you forward a little bit when you make your shifts right there. And I'll make another one here. And yeah, it's just very cool the way this happens. Now before this, I experienced a shifting cue through the transducer function of my D-Box setup. And that's one of the cool things about D-Box that no other actuator system currently does out there is it has a transducer element in the actual actuator so you don't need transducers anymore. But back to the transducer effect, it just gives you a nice punch hit that you can feel on the chassis when you make the shift. Well here, it's different. You're actually getting a snap forward. You can see how it pops forward, your, your seat pops forward into your back. And it's a much more realistic, I think, feeling of the car actually shifting than just the, a transducer making the hit on the chassis. It just gives you that physical feel that those hits don't give you because you're actually being pushed forward. And it feels obviously that you're being pushed back into the seat every shift you make, which in a real high powered race car, you certainly can feel that. It has so much power every time you snap that shifting paddle. Yeah, you get a jolt in your back because the car's accelerating and it pops forward. And that's what this is able to replicate and it's like I said it was a pleasant surprise I, I wasn't even expecting this and you know it's something that you think might not make that much difference but yeah when you're going down the straights and you're hitting the shifter it's it's a really cool effect to have and again helps you understand the characteristics of the car that you're driving which I think is always a plus so now let's talk about the rest of the system and how it all comes together we're in the 488 Ferrari at Sebring and iRacing and we can't forget that we are also sitting on four D-Box actuators, one at each corner at this chassis. And of course, that goes without saying, that's a great ride. I have that my P1 set up that way that I normally use all the time. And here we have the pitch, heave, and roll. And pitch and roll is very good. Heave is also a very important factor or element here for your immersion because it allows you to really feel the bumps and undulations in a track if it's properly set up or modeled. And yeah, in the Ferrari around the Sebring, you know, all this comes together. You're just slipping deeper into the immersion pool. <laughs> it just comes together so well here with a circuit and a circuit type car. And, you know, I wanted to try the car here. I wanted to try it at my, one of my other favorite tracks. And that's over at the ring, which we see right here. And Again, you know, the system just comes together so well. It gives you the cue, the surge comes in on top of the roll, pitch, and heave to give you that cue of just how the car is braking and, it's, and how it's handling under braking that you will never get just from your direct drive wheel 
and the pressure you're getting from the pedal as far as the feedback you're getting from pushing down on the pedal real hard. And of course I have load cell and hydraulic pedals that I use. So all of those require a little bit, let's say just firm pressure on them to push them down. And yeah, you can, and I have been obviously doing very quick track times without the surge factor being in thrown in with the roll pitch and heave here. But yeah, once the surge comes in, it really opens up the braking in the engine braking factors of a car. It makes you understand more what the car is doing in a turn, coming out of a turn, entry into the turn. It just all around just gives you more information for your body to absorb. It just feels more natural uh, when you turn the wheel in the car and how it reacts. And of course, we want to try some other stuff. And here we have the McLaren MP40. We're over at Monza. And yeah, this actually feels very good too, as you might imagine. It's, you know, obviously an F1 car. So it has a very tight suspension and very good brakes on it. And you feel every bit of that, especially in the heavy, heavy rather braking areas. And actually I've got the effects turned down a bit here in this particular sequence. Um, you know, after running it and running it and some of it, you know, having it pumped up high and then bring it back down low, I prefer it kind of in the medium section there. But the, you know, again, it's the same theme really carried on to a different car in a different type of circuit. And that's, yeah, it just all comes together so well. And it's something that you, the surge is something that brings, is, you can sense it was missing before. Now when I get in my other cockpit that just has a pitch roll and heave, it's, it feels like something's missing right away, as you might imagine, of course. And yeah, this is, it's so really, I, I'm not a big F1 fan as far as driving the cars, but it made me feel more comfortable in this car at speeds because they're so quick and they react so quick. So I guess that's the best thing to say about it. It just made me feel comfortable. They're more comfortable than I normally am in that kind of car. Now we're moving over to, and I've told you we're gonna try everything here. This is something I normally do not do and that's the oval stuff, um, NASCAR, you know, the ovals. And we're in a Ford Mustang here, we're at Richmond. And I purposely chose a short track. And this was the big surprise. This was the eye opener that it really comes to play in a in a short track in a car like this because you're on the gas, you're off the gas, you're on the gas, and, and then you're hitting a little bit of brakes to get into the turn right, and then you're off, and you can really feel so much better what the car is doing in the turn as you, you know, you know how much engine braking you get, so you know where you need to let off the gas and where you need to bring it back on, and you know exactly where you need to put the brakes in because you just feel all that with this surge element. And this, like I said, was a big surprise to me. It caught me off guard for completely that, yeah, this really works well on the short tracks. Now, the long tracks, not so much, you know, a mile and a half or so, because mainly you have your pedal to the metal all the way. <laughs> so the short tracks, it really shines, though. So now we're moving over to the rally cross car. And this is where it kind of met the expectation, the surge element. Of course, the rest of the roll, pitch, and heave is working quite well as it normally does. But here, you don't have a lot of heavy braking or, or shifting cues. It's such a loosely sprung suspension on a rally cross car that it, it just, you just don't feel much here. And even when you're on the brakes, you're sliding. So, and of course, if this system is replicating what the car is doing, then it's doing its job. And here, it doesn't do as much because we're sliding all over the place. Basically, we're very you know, tight everywhere, pushing everywhere. Then you get loose everywhere. It's just, uh, it's a lot of fun, don't get me wrong. I really like doing this stuff as far as rally cross and rally in general. But the surge really doesn't shine here. You can still sense it in some of the braking areas. I mean, it's obviously it's still there, but yeah, it's just too slippery, you know, on dirt stuff. And the dirt oval's the same way. It's just so slippery, it's, it doesn't, the suspension doesn't give the cues that you would think they would. So yeah, for dirt, yeah, it still works, but not that great. Final thoughts on the JCL V4 Full Motion Simulator. JC Goudard is a man who drives his own race car in real races. So if anyone is qualified to build a simulator to replicate the feeling of driving a real race car, it would be someone like him, I think. And I think the resulting immersion you get from the V4 is proof of that. When I first saw the videos of the V4 platform in action, it didn't look as though the driver would feel much more than some good braking effects as you are pressed into the harness and that would pretty much be it. As with many things in the sim racing hardware world, pictures or videos are not a good way to judge how a motion system is working. Now, selecting D-Box to provide motion elements in the V4 was a wise choice, I think. 
In my opinion, it is the best actuator motion system when you want a seasoned, fully developed turnkey system. With an intuitive and easy to use user interface, it will also be an easier solution to support and service once the system has been deployed and is in use by the consumer. The V4 platform uses the 4 actuator Gen 2 4250 kit from D-Box as the base motion element, providing the usual awesome tactile pitch roll and heave motion elements, with a single 1250i 3 inch actuator to provide the fourth DOF motion element, Surge. Now, the build quality of the V4 chassis is certainly at a commercial level. Very well laid out cable management and heavy duty corner brackets are used throughout the build. The very clever slider system that JCL has developed here works a treat. The thick cockpit slider brackets mount to an hourglass shaped rail, which looks to me to be made from a Delrin type material. The actual slider mechanism houses two opposing rows of ball bearings riding on the upper ridge of that rail. Now this is, provides a very slick movement while requiring minimal effort to actually move it. The system is also used on the quick controls adjusting elements, adding a locking system that is so well made it only requires a minimal effort to release and secure it. Speaking of quick controls feature on the V4 that I'm testing here, if you have the need to quickly change between different sized drivers in a game center environment or a simulator that a race team has to use or something like that, the quick controls feature is a must, I would think. Making control location changes could not be easier or quicker. Now let's talk a bit about the Surge DOF that this system delivers. JCL and D-Box have been collaborating on this result for more than two years now. And I think the final result is something that will change your mind about how effective the Surge effect can actually be. It's much more than just a chassis that moves forward under braking. It can actually replicate the varying amount of g-force you feel under all braking conditions. Continuing to squeeze you against the harness belts as you reach the end of your braking threshold marks. It does this with a surprising amount of finesse and accuracy that you need to experience to be able to fully appreciate. Then there is the awesome effect of engine braking that this system actually delivers. This really is the first time that I've been in any motion solution that can do this. To actually feel a race car's engine braking while feathering the throttle in a corner is quite an eye opener and allows you to learn a certain car's handling characteristics unlike, well, I think ever before. The shifting cues the V4 delivers are also the best I've felt to date. Having your whole cockpit pop forward during upshifts is, of course, much better than just having a pitch motion or what tactile solutions can deliver with their bumps. Overall, the V4 D-Box solution that I received has made me change the way I look at motion simulation now. The configuration that D-Box and JCL has developed for this V4 system is spot on. Not hard to see that there were many hours of development being put in here to deliver something that is so convincing to so many. This is the first time I had other drivers actually ask me <laughs> when was the earliest time that they could come back to the SRG and have another session in this V4 full, full motion rather platform. I think that speaks volumes right there. Now, you can buy this platform in many different configuration levels. The V4 is a very flexible design that can be used with a cockpit of your own choosing, like a SimLab P1X. All you have to do is tell JCL how wide your cockpit is, and they can build the V4 platform to fit it. Then they will professionally crate it up and ship it, well, just about to anywhere in the world. If you have the means, the V4 would be an awesome motion system to own, no doubt. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.